right, hello everybody and welcome to the Intrepid Global Citizen Podcast. This is the place for vagabonds, adventurers, nobads, and especially global citizens. So if you want an adventure-based education, this is the place for you. And today we have an OG in the world of adventure travel. He's been quite a few places. He's been through 16 countries on a bicycle, 21,000 kilometers through Central Asia, through, he went from France to Turkey by bicycle, through Mongolia, Australia, New Zealand. We have Roman. So welcome to the show, Roman. Hello, how are you guys? Yeah, great, great. Thank you so much for coming. It's an honor and a pleasure. He's also, a, he has a YouTube channel promoting Malaysia and he's about to go on a walking trip, 500 kilometers from one end of Malaysia to the next in the heat. So we're looking forward to listening to a lot of fun stories that you have and about your plans. So maybe you could just give us a brief introduction of you and how did you end up in Malaysia? And yeah, just to tell us a little bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is Romal. I'm originally from, from France. And I left France when I was 21 years old. So, um, I did not speak a word of English before, so it was really, really hard for me to find a job abroad. So at 21, I just decided to lie on my resume. I was say that oh, I speak English, and I sent it to different companies, and I finally found a job in uh, in the Bahamas. Someone called me and said, "Hi, hey, do you speak English?" The person was speaking French on the phone, so I would fine so do you speak english and everything say oh yeah yeah, yeah. i speak english so that's awesome we need someone to speak french in english but you need to live in a week to the bahamas i was like oh <laughs> in a week i was like all right yeah yeah no problem and they sent me the ticket fly and everything i arrived in the bahamas couldn't speak a word of english they were really really pissed and i said we give you three months to um to speak english otherwise you're gonna have to go back to france uh, at your own cost. And I just bought a book and study English by myself every day. And after three months, they, they kept me. <laughs> they kept me. And this was the, the uh, how to say, the, the opportunity that I was looking for, you know, like someone gave me the opportunity to learn the language and to be able to traveling. And then I went to uh, different places. I went to, to Spain, I've learned Spanish in Spain, then I went to Cyprus, England, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, and end up in Malaysia in 2018. Okay, wow, that's fascinating. So as an English educator myself and a, a lover of languages, I also try to learn languages. Could you give us, it sounds like you learned very quickly these languages. Can you give us some tips about how to study? I, I, didn't, I didn't have a choice because I was the only French over there and I was working with Americans people and I was working with people from a different country. There was people from Costa Rica, from Argentina, but uh, everyone had to speak English. I didn't speak a word of Spanish at that time because it was in 2003. So if I wanted to speak to someone, I had to speak English. And the thing is, Sorry to say, but the way we learned English in Europe, it's really, really bad. You know, like they teach you how to write, but they don't teach you how to speak. And I couldn't speak a word. It was like people were speaking to me and I was like, I don't understand why I couldn't, couldn't speak back, you know? So I was, I, yeah, I remember the, this book I bought and I was learning all the verbs, you know, and you have all the, the past, the future and everything. And I was writing all my words and trying to repeat all the words again and again and again. And it was, it was, it was a pain. It was really a pain for, for three months. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. But you kept the job. That's amazing. And, yeah, and you, the job, yeah. and they the were, job. they were happy with you and they kept you after that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a story. And, uh, so, and then you ended up in Malaysia. How did you end up in Malaysia and uh, the, settling that, uh, settling down? I, I met my, my wife in 2013. So I was backpacking in, uh, in Malaysia. I was working in New Zealand, sorry, before I was already working in New Zealand. And I went backpacking in Malaysia for one month. And I don't know if you know the, the website called Couch Surfing. Sure. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Couchsurfing is a website for, for travelers. So people can host you. They host you for one or two nights and then they show you around a little bit and this kind of thing. And instead, I was supposed to stay two days, but I stayed a month and a half to a place, fell in love with her. And then I was on my way back to, to New Zealand. And after a month, I said to her, do you, do you want to, to follow me in New Zealand? And she said, yes. And she quit a job, but she just bought a car a month ago before to meet me. She sold the car, sold all the stuff and joined me in, uh, in New Zealand. And after three months, I proposed. <laughs> so I already proposed her and we got married, spent five years in New Zealand. And uh, after five years, she really, really wanted to come back to, to Malaysia. She missed uh, the food in Malaysia. It was a little bit too cold for her as well in New Zealand because it's getting very cold during winter. And we moved back to Malaysia, to, to Malaysia in 2018. Oh, wow. What were you guys doing in New Zealand? So I was a photographer in New Zealand. Uh-huh. And Fiza, my wife, she's normally a project secretary for oil and gas company. But we were living in a city of 800 people in New Zealand. So it was very, very small city. So she had to do a lot of uh, like um, working in the, at the bakery. She did some... Uh, a housekeeping job and this kind of thing. So it was really, really hard for her as well. It's not the kind of job that she was used to do. So, Sure, sure. That must have been a lot of culture shocks too. I mean, going yeah. from Malaysia to New Zealand and yeah. yeah. And from, you were in the, the capital of New Zealand then? Or no, no, I was city? living in the city of oh, 800 people. 800, 800 people. Wow. Yeah, so it was so small, so small. Okay. Two groceries you needed to do like 140 kilometers by car to go groceries because it was only a small supermarket where, where we were and it was really expensive. So if you want to do big wow. groceries, it was a penny, penny in the ass. <laughs> wow. So how often did you go on that 140 once kilometer? Month. Once, once a month? month did, at first, we did not have a car. So we, we needed to rent a car to go grocery. Wow. So you spend already $60 to rent the car. You spend another $60 on gas. And spend maybe three or four hundred dollars on grocery to oh get there. So, <laughs> New wow. Zealand is, but it's very very expensive in a, uh, for food. You know, food is extremely expensive in, in New Zealand. Wow, wow, that's interesting. So I can understand how she would have missed Kuala Lumpur and all the yeah. conveniences of the big city, and you too probably, right? Yeah, yeah, because when you want to eat in, in Kuala Lumpur, for example, yesterday we just went to a small restaurant in Malaysia, they call it the, the mamak, and you can have rice, chicken, you can have a drink each, and you spend, let's say, $4. So it's like, it's super cheap, you know? We spent less than $4 yesterday. Yesterday we spent about $3.50 for, wow. for two meals and drinks, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's amazing. That, that's the right price. And it's good, good food, you know, it's not, it's not, you at a restaurant, you know, you're not even eating on the street, you go to the restaurant. So it's... Wow, wow. <laughs> Sounds like a good place for any, any budget traveler. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, see, just looking at your YouTube videos, you're so enthusiastic about Malaysia and you're visiting all these places around the country. Um so for me, I'm a single guy. I'm living in Seoul, which I enjoy life in Seoul. But if you were to make a sales pitch for a guy like me who's single and enjoys traveling to move to Kuala Lumpur, what would you tell me? To move to Kuala Lumpur to, to live there or to yeah, travel? To, uh, to either one. How about to move there since you live there? Uh, would you recommend it? I, I, it would depend of the of you because if you don't like big cities, then it's gonna be it's gonna be tough for for you. For me, it's it's been hard now because I'm a countryside person. You know, I love the nature and everything. And living in Kuala Lumpur with traffic and everything is is tough sometimes. You know, it's tough. But there is a lot of good things to do around the, around the city. There is a lot of good restaurants, good places to to go hiking and this kind of thing. Okay. But it's traffic. Sometimes, you know, we live at seven, only seven kilometers from the city center. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it takes us 40 minutes just to go there because of traffic. And this, oh. this I, I can't stand it very much. You know, like, sure. it's tiring. 
exciting. But beside this, when you get out of Kuala Lumpur, then, then it's heaven. You know, there is so many places to, to go. If you love the, the beaches, there is beautiful island in, in Malaysia. We're going next, next month. I can't wait. <laughs> really can't wait because last year we couldn't go because of COVID. All the islands were closed last year. We couldn't get out from Kuala Lumpur. Wow. So now it's time, you know, it's time after two years, three years since my last trip. I'm, I'm like this, you know, like <laughs> being locked down in the city for three years. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm... yeah what have you been doing since your site? I mean, for, for all of us that enjoy adventure travel and getting out there, it's been tough. But I mean, how have you been dealing with the We've, pandemic? That's why we started our YouTube channel. Actually, we start our YouTube channel in the middle of the, the, the COVID crisis. We started in uh, August 2020. And because we couldn't go anywhere, we, we decided to focus on Malaysia only because it's, we couldn't go anywhere anyway. So we started first uh, looking for places to eat, you know, places that maybe people don't, don't know about. So we tried to find some hidden restaurant in Kuala Lumpur, contacting the people because we didn't have much budget either. So we we're saying like, okay, I'm gonna shoot a video for you. And maybe in exchange, you offer us a free meal and this kind of thing. And people were keen. So we started doing this. We did a lot of different restaurants in KL. And after we thought maybe we can do the same for hotels. So we started contacting different hotels and say, oh, we're going to go there uh, next week. Do you mind to sponsor us two nights and we shoot a video for you? And people say, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And we keep growing like this. So it's nice. Yeah, you look like you're having a great time in your videos. I mean, just going yeah, to all yeah. these restaurants and eating this amazing food and staying in these hotels. And some of them are are really nice too. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, how about Kuala Lumpur for cycling? Do you cycle around Kuala Lumpur? So? Ah, you can't, you can't. Okay. It's, it's the city, you know, there is traffic. It's, it's, very, it's quite dangerous. People... So I'd say they, they don't drive very well in Kuala Lumpur. You know, they don't respect the rules very much. So it's quite dangerous. And there is a lot of highway. So you're not allowed on the bicycle on the highway. Okay. So I, I, can't, I can't cycle here. If I wanted to cycle, I would need to, to take a train at a, at a certain time because they, you cannot put your bicycle in the train um, anytime you want. So I would need maybe to put the bicycle at 7 a.m. in a in the morning and then uh, go 30 kilometers outside of KL to start cycling. So okay. I, never done, I never done it because it's, it's to, to get to the train, I would need my wife to put my bicycle in the car, remove all the wheels, you know, go to the next place. It's, it's, it would be just a pain. It would be impossible. Yeah. To, you know, like, sure, sure. Yeah. Wow. That sounds like, sounds like a bit of a hassle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's advantages and disadvantages of living in the city, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, so so you started traveling back in 2004 when you were 21, right? So how did you become interested in traveling back then? I always wanted to travel. And that's one of the reasons why I, I lied on my resume is because I really, really wanted to, to go abroad and everything. And when you can't speak English. It's really hard to find a job abroad. And when I started with the, the Bahamas, like I said, they give me the opportunity to, to find other jobs. And as soon as I could, I was like, I'm going to save money and start backpacking, you know? And my sister is actually from Vietnam. So that was my first country that I went to backpacking. My parents did an adoption when she was uh, only two months old in uh, 1998. And that's the first country uh, I went, maybe because my sister is from Vietnam, so I wanted to see her country. And I had only like 700 euros in my pocket when I went there. I just bought a one-way ticket to Vietnam and I was, you know, I was going to the unknown. I didn't know what I was doing. So I was on maybe $10 a day, <laughs> $10 a day just to eat, sleep and everything. So, yeah. Wow. How was your impression of uh, coming from France to Vietnam too, right? That's, I mean, what was yeah. your impression of Vietnam? Yeah, yeah, I was amazed, you know, I didn't, 
like I said, you don't know what to do. You know, you, you arrive at the airport, you say, okay, now I am by myself. You know, how do I do this? How do I get there? At that time, we did not have a, a phone to tell you where to go and where to sleep and everything. You know, I had only the Lonely Planet with me. And the only way you could go from A to B is to ask people. And people didn't speak much English either in Vietnam. So you meet other travelers that maybe are more experienced than you and you're asking them and they yeah, it was, it was the adventure at this time, you know, like nowadays when you want to go backpacking, you just book your hotel on booking.com and it's so easy, so easy to travel. You're lost, you ask Google map and you know how, where, where to go, you know, at that time you're lost, you're lost, you know, like <laughs> you need, <laughs> you need to ask people to, to find your way. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started back in 2007 too, and uh, yeah, that was a few years after you. But back then, I mean, it was just paper maps and using a lot yeah. of body language, and uh, it's just a, it's it's great. Yeah, I miss that time. Now we're all addicted to our phone. You know, you, most most backpackers now there is no backpackers that will not go traveling without their phone. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. It will be able to travel like we did like 20 years ago <laughs> that's that's the thing i mean yeah it was it was a beautiful thing i mean i remember going into hostels and everybody was just one community cooking meals together and and just hanging out together and it was the community of uh travel travelers was just uh i i really enjoyed that back in those days for Very sure much yeah and then so you you traveled around a bit in southeast asia then you started in vietnam did you yeah. did you go so in 2004 then... i did uh, vietnam and cambodia in in 2004 and then i had to go back to work because i didn't have much money uh, at the time so i went back to work for uh, three years and i did another trip in 2008 in 2008 i left for eight months so i went back to vietnam and then I went to Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. I did a day trip to Myanmar. And then I went to Malaysia for the first time, then Singapore, India, and Nepal. So I stayed for eight months on the road, spent like 3,500 euro in eight months. So I was on a tight budget as well, but I did a lot of countries and a lot of travels. <laughs> okay, okay. And then how did you make the transition to cycling from backpacking? How did that work for you? So in 2010, I went on a working holiday. That was the first time I, I, I do a working holiday visa. I went to Australia and um, I found a job within a week in Australia. I was working uh, in Perth, cleaning dishes, you know, and I worked for Greenpeace at the same time. And I realized that Australia was very expensive to travel, you know, compared to Southeast Asia. It's very expensive, even though you want to travel by bus or you want to stay at a hostel or everything. A hostel in Australia in 2010 was $27 per night in the dome. Wow. In the dome. In Malaysia, <coughs> sorry, in Malaysia in 2008, I think I was paying 15 ringgit. So 15 ringgit is like $2.50 a night, you know, <laughs> $2.50 a night. So I was like, how the hell am I going to travel? everywhere in Australia and spending $27 every night. I want, this is not going to be possible. I'm not going to see anything. So I said, oh, why not? I try to cycle, you know, like I saw, because I, I've seen this in few uh, um, website, people started cycling with, oh, maybe that's a good option. And I started looking at how much does it cost for a bike? How much does it cost for a trailer and everything? And I just bought the cheapest bike I could find, the cheapest trailer I could find on, the, on eBay and started cycling. I was like, oh, ah. the first week was, was tough, you know, like I couldn't sit, I couldn't walk, I couldn't, my legs was extremely sore. But I was like, oh, that's still fun, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I did yeah. the first 3,500 kilometers to a town called Port Lincoln, because I ran out of money. And I worked on the harvest boat for three months, feeding tuna on the harvest boat, get a lot of money and finished my trip on the Gold Coast, and I did 7,500 kilometers. Wow, wow. So you were, this was like in, in the outback, right? I mean, it's pretty rough yeah. in Australia. 
Yeah. yeah a lot of animals. Awesome. Any encounters with animals or any scares no. like that? No. No, I never seen any any wild animal. I've seen some uh, scorpions, some ants, like massive ants like this, like the red ants like this. Uh, no, I, I didn't have any 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 problem at all. Oh wow, that's that's crazy. And so so you didn't you just got any old bike off of eBay with a trailer. Um, did you did you know anything about bicycle repairs or anything? Did you have? Nothing. Nothing. I didn't know nothing. I never, I never rode my bicycle more than 10 kilometers before in my life. So <laughs> it's just riding the bicycle where I was living in, in France just to go to the beach and everything. But I never done more than 10 kilometers on the bicycle. So like I said, that the first week and a half, two weeks was, was really tough. Because on the first day, I did 80 kilometers on the first day. And I, I did not even know I was about to do 80 kilometers on the bicycle, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, I had to learn, you know, when I had the punches, when I had a problem with the bicycle, I, I had to fix it myself or to bring it to the, to the bike shop to, to fix it. Yeah, yeah. So, so every time you had a breakdown or a puncture, you had to find a ride to, yeah, to yeah. take oh, it there punches, yourself. I, know how to fix the, I, I yeah. learned quickly how to, to fix okay. the, the punches. But yeah. uh, the, if I had a problem with the driller or everything, I... I, I, I still not really good with fixing bicycle. You know, I don't really like fixing bicycle. I like to ride it, but I'm not good at fixing it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's one of the things, one of the big challenges, right? Yeah. Mean, you never know when it's gonna break down or keep it, taking your bike on a plane too. You don't know if they're gonna the yeah. airline workers are gonna just throw it in the car and it's gonna yeah, you're gonna yeah, have exactly. a surprise when you open it up. That yeah. can uh, that can be stressful for sure. Yeah. So so you have quite a bit of stories on your YouTube channel regarding especially tour cycling. One of the stories that really got my attention was you said you were, I think, in the China Kazakh border, and you were going to be fined one hundred dollars. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, and then. They were going to find you, but they ended up taking you on a tour of a canyon, right? Instead yes, of finding yeah. you. So, can you tell us? That sounds like a really fun story. I'd like to hear more details about yeah, that. That was fun. That was fun. I, it's fun now. <laughs> so, my friend and I, uh, because I did this trip with a friend from uh, Australia, uh, this guy that I met. Uh, sorry, I explained who is this person. Uh, we met in 2008 in, in Vietnam. And uh, we just split up, you know, because at that time we couldn't keep in touch on Facebook and this kind of thing. It's not something people used to do at that time. And I met this guy in, in Laos again, in the middle of nowhere, you know, in Laos. Hey, we met in Vietnam, blah, 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 blah. And two months later, we met again in Thailand. I was like, what the hell? You know, like, are you following me or what? And we keep in touch. At this time, we say, oh, fuck, we need to keep in touch, you know. It's been three times we met. We both traveling in Southeast Asia and we keep meet, meeting up. We, we need to keep in touch. So we keep in touch. In 2015, I said, I am planning to do a, a bike trip from uh, Mongolia to France. At that time, I wanted to go from Mongolia to France. Would you join me? And say, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. I join you. And we cross Mongolia. We cross China. And when we arrive in, in Kazakhstan, uh, we cross the, the border, stay in this small town. And on the fur, we spent one night there. The next day we wanted to cycle and we couldn't cycle at all. The wind was so strong that we couldn't move. We were like at two kilometers an hour, we couldn't move. So we turned back, we did maybe five kilometers. We turned back and said, we'll try again tomorrow because we can't move, you know, like. And um, when we wanted to leave again, we just stopped at a grocery store just to buy something. And then the military came and say, oh, you are not allowed to be here and we, you're going to be fine. You know, we're, we're going to have to find you a uh, hundred bucks each and we're going to have to bring you to, to another city because this is a military zone. You're not allowed to be here. And when we were in the truck, they took our bike and everything. We're like, oh my God, they're going to steal our bike. They're going to bring us somewhere else. You know, we're going to be robbed and everything. And we started chatting with them, trying to chat with them because they couldn't speak much English. And we took some food out of our bag and we started sharing the food with them. 
and they start laughing and everything and they had a gun like a how you call it like a m m is it m4 ladder i don't know how you call it yeah yeah and they give you and they say oh you want a gun and everything for photos and so they remove of course the the bullet things and we start taking photos with the the gun in the, in the truck and at the end we be asking us where are you going where are you planning to go and so we want to go to your canyon called the the Cheryl Canyon. I said, we bring you there, we bring you there. I was like, all right. <laughs> and they bring us there and uh, they drop our bike from, from their truck. I said, I'll go, go. And they didn't find us at the end. I was like, oh, all right, that's cool. <laughs> wow, wow. And this was in, wow. Wow, this is uh, Xinjiang, yeah? Xinjiang and uh, on the Western China. And the border with Kazakhstan is that? That's right. I yeah. Can't remember the, I can't remember the name. Yeah. Can't remember okay. The name. We passed by Aronque, Aronque, and we went to a lake with the Seram Lake. And after a few kilometers, after you have the the border with with Kazakhstan, I can't remember the August. August, I think it was the name of the border. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but and that was your. Uh, when I was in that part of China, it sounds like we were in the same part of China, but I was there in 2017. Um, I had quite a few run-ins with the police there too. How do I, did you camp at night? Did you have any problems camping in that part of China with we the police? Knew, we're, no, no, because we are trying to hide as well. So every time we find some bush and everything, we try to hide behind the bush. And also you, because we know that you're not really allowed to do this in China either. Um, I had another problem in, in, in China. Uh, my friend had an infection with his eye and we are stopped in a city called, Ta sorry if I pronounce it wrong, Tachikien or something like this. It's just after the, the Mongolian border. And uh, because of his infection, we needed to buy some medication and we run out of money. We were really bad with uh, money <laughs> things. And, <laughs> So we keep running out of money every time, every time we don't have enough money with us. And we went to the ATM and they didn't take MasterCard, you know, they didn't take Visa. The only uh, uh, money uh, card they accept is called Union Card. So we couldn't draw money. I was like, what the fuck, how are we gonna do it? And we went to the police station and say, oh, we run out of money. We need medication because my friend has an infection uh, to his eye. So what, what do we do? He said, oh, you need to take a bus and go 500 kilometers to the next town to draw money. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> it's going to be a pain. And we couldn't pay the hotel and everything. And um, some people give us money. Some people offer us like almost $50. They give us like almost $50 for us to take the bus and everything. So I had to take the bus by myself, go to the next town. And then I started looking for a place to sleep. I bought the medication, started to looking for a place to sleep. And every time I was going to the hotel, I said, no, no, no foreigners. I was like, what do you mean no foreigners? And I did like 10, 15 different uh, hotels there. No, no, no foreigners, no foreigners. I said, where do I'm going to sleep? You know, it's five degrees at night because it was very, very cold. And the police came to me and said, passport, passport. I give my passport. They take the passport, put it in his pocket, and start asking me money. I was like, what the hell? Are you, are you gonna give my passport? So no, 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 you need to go to this hotel. $300 a night, very nice. I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> $300 a night is my budget for the month, you know? And they say, if you don't stay here, you, I don't give you your passport. And I, I started shouting at him and, sorry, insulting him and everything. And at the end, he threw my passport in my face and say, go, go, go. And I had to spend the night uh, outside. So I spent the night at five degrees. I had only one jacket, sleeping at night outside, took the bus, went back to the city, and we, <laughs> and that's a. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Yeah, that sounds like a crazy story. <laughs> but, but you I got have, the, but you got the medication <laughs> in the end. Then. I got the medication. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow, that's that's really something. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, the cops you really have to watch out for on all, a lot of these places. I thought the of corrupted cops everywhere. You know, depend. It doesn't matter where you go, you will always find corrupted cops anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Wow. 
And then, so you cycled through Central Asia then, right? So yeah. Kazakhstan and then Kyrgyzstan and T Tajikistan and the Pamir Highway. Yeah. Yeah, so, so a lot of like, how was the Pamir Highway back then? Because right now this is like the place to do a tour cycling trip. Everybody wants to go there, but how was it back when you did it? Beautiful. It's very, very beautiful. The, when we crossed the, the border from Kyrgyzstan to Tajikistan, you just start to go in the middle of nowhere. The, the, the border is it's not a proper border. You can go with your car and you pass the border and you're in the mud already. You pass the border and you, you're cycling in the mud. You're in the middle of nowhere. There is nothing. And we go up to 4,000 meters and it's still nothing. So if something bad happened to you, you're screwed. You know, there is no one. There is no one. And something funny is when we cross the border from Kyrgyzstan to Tajikistan, you know, the guy has a, like a, a spray to disinfect the, our tires. I was like, are you kidding me? And he asked us to pay for it. You know, it was like, it was nothing. It was like $2. They say, oh yeah, yeah, you need to pay $2 for me to disinfect your tires. It's like, we're in the mud. I'm covered in mud. My bicycle is covered in mud. And you're gonna tell me that you're gonna disinfect my tires? It's like, <laughs> it, doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. So yeah, yeah, you have to pay, you have to pay. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. This affect my tires, take the two dollars, that's all right. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's so funny, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just wanted bright, you know, he just wanted yeah, to get sure. a little bit of money for his pockets, but it was like, but looking at each other with my friend was like, do it, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> take the two dollars, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes from your video, I think you, you you probably were on that border. I remember one of your videos, it was so muddy. And uh, the best, one of the best quotes you said was, we're going to ride through the mud, and that's not going to change anything. It was just like yeah. a serious voice tone. And it's like, we're going to do it. It doesn't even matter. So, yeah, exactly. So I got a good <laughs> laugh out of that. Yeah. And then cycling through Mongolia, too. I mean, your video, I mean, it looks intense. You were hiding in little <coughs> concrete culverts, like escaping from the sandstorms and the weather. If there's one thing Mongolia is notoriously famous for, it's it's wind, sandstorms and, yeah. and cold, especially in, in the yeah, winter. And yeah. in the summer, it can be cold, too, in Mongolia, too. So how yeah, did you... How did you deal with that? I think Mongolia has the biggest amplitude in the world. So it could be 30 degrees during the day and minus 25 degrees at night. So we didn't really know how to dress. You know, you just needed to, to wait the next day to see how the weather likes. Sometimes where you can see on the video, sometimes it's just with a t-shirt or sleeveless. And sometimes we have 10 jackets on the top of 10 jacket because it's freezing cold. And the, the hardest parts in Malaysia, the, the desert, the desert was, was hard, was, well, it was really, really tough. But the hardest part was the wind. We had some days we did um, 40 kilometers in seven hours. I don't know if people can imagine to do 40 kilometers in seven hours because of the wind and the cold. We are literally at two kilometers an hour, two kilometers an hour looking at each other, stopping on the side of the road, and like, what the hell? Do we do you know like we can't move we can't go anywhere even though you go uh down your bike and push the bike you have to push the bike and go against the wind like this you couldn't push your bike so and there's no one there is no one sometimes you spend two two days three days and you don't even see a car on the concrete road you know and you're like same as tajikistan something bad happened you screwed <laughs> you screwed uh, yeah. Wow. Wow. And how did you find the will to, to keep going? I mean, I'm sure it was really frustrating. You're, you're going you so slow. <laughs> you don't have a choice. <laughs> it's survival, right? You just need to go. And you know that you, we always have food with us, but the, the, the hardest part was water as well, because when you're riding, you need a lot of water every day. We drink maybe five liters of, at least four or five liters of water drinking. And you need another two liters a day at least to cook because we were cooking every night. And we run out of water once in a, 
no, twice, twice in the desert. And we found this guy on a horse in the middle of the desert. And the guy was looking at us like, what the hell are you doing here? You know, like, and he brought us to a wheel in the middle of the desert. We would never find it, never find it. There was a wheel in the middle of the desert. So we started filling up our bottles and everything. So happy to be able to, to drink. Sorry, I have my cats complaining over there. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it. It's all right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So we filled up our bottles, started cooking, drinking and everything. And we didn't have much water left. We were like, that's okay. You know, there is a will. So tomorrow morning before we, we, uh, we go, we will fill up our bottle, go back to the wheel in the morning and someone drop the, the bucket at the bottom of the wheel. So we started the day with no water again. I was like, damn, you know, like, <laughs> so we had to do like 60 kilometers to go to the next town to be able to, to fill up our bottle again. So... <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. You just appreciate things like being in an apartment with running water and uh, yeah. food and refrigeration when you're on trips I wish like this. People in a, in a desert, even though there is not much, you see some yurts sometime in the middle of the, of the desert. They seem closed, you know, but they are not closed at all. You, you see them and when you start walking, you're like, damn, they are very, very, very far. But when people see us on the bicycle, they actually come to you, you know, and they're asking you straight away, you want a drink? I was like, yeah, 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 <laughs> we need water. So they brought me on, the, on their motorbike. I left my bicycle with my friend. They brought me to the house, fill up all our bottle. And straight away, they asked, do you want to sleep here? Do you want to eat? Do you want to? So they are very, very welcoming, you know, very, very welcoming. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then... Uh... Yeah, I'm sure after that, just being in a yurt is just like heaven, right? Even though you're sleeping on a floor, you're all sweaty and dirty. But just being yeah. inside, it must have felt just like being in heaven, out of the elements, right? Away from the sand. Yeah, oh, that's okay. That's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. And how was your tent? I mean, with these sandstorms and wind at nighttime in Mongolia, your, your tent was fine. It didn't break. Or... Yeah, I did not have any problem. I bought, I bought a quite a good tent, you know, because I knew that I needed good gears. It's important to buy good gears when you do a trip like this. My sleeping bag cost me over $200 uh, for, for the sleeping bag. But it was worth it. It was worth it because in it, at night I was sleeping with my clothes on, with all my fermors, my jacket, my bennies, and I was still cold in my sleeping bag. And my sleeping bag was made to stay under 15, uh, minus 15 degrees. So it was minus 20, minus 25 at night. And I was still cold in my, in my sleeping bag. So <laughs> I was really happy to have spent $200 on my, on my sleeping bag. <laughs> wow, wow, minus 25 at night. So we did you were waking up in the morning and all our water was frozen in the morning. So we couldn't drink in the morning, couldn't cook because all our, our bottles were, were frozen. Wow. Wow. Did you, um, wow. And there, it, it snowed then as well when you were in Mongolia, there's a lot of snow. snow. We didn't, okay. We didn't have snow, but it was, it was really, really cold. Really, really cold. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you just had to wait and until yeah. they came for your water to melt, right? So yeah, did. exactly. Yeah, yeah, because the, yeah, like I said before, you know, during the the day it's getting hot. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes not every day, but sometimes it's getting hot. So your water after two hours and froze, so you can drink. <coughs> yeah. Wow! Wow! <laughs> so the pole, of the, the pole of the tent as well in the morning. I didn't do it. Um, uh, I didn't be careful the first time. And you know, when it gets frozen, it's kind of aluminum. And my fingers get stuck on the aluminum once. And I couldn't move my finger, I removed my finger and I lost all the skin. Ooh. My, my fingers, because I didn't print intention of it. I didn't know that it was that cold, you know, and I, I get stuck, remove my fingers. Ouch. Ooh. <laughs> the skin of it, yeah, like really painful. <laughs> so I had to do everything with my glove actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah <laughs> wow crazy and uh so when you go on these trips too you're doing uh you you did a fundraiser right i remember in one of your videos saying you were you were doing a fundraiser for girls in africa and in central asia i think is that right 
did this for Amnesty International and the, the company uh, charity called One Girl. And One Girl fight for girls' education in Africa, in Sierra Leone and Uganda. Girls over there are around 14 years old, you know, they are forced to get married. So they never have a chance to get an education. So this charity fight for this. So we thought it would be a, a good, good cause to, to, to raise money for. And at that time, we, um, we had like a little contest. We were asking people to send us there. And when they send us there, they used to give us money. So one person asking us to eat uh, like the thousand years old egg. I don't know if you know this egg in, in China. It's, no, no. Can you tell us about that? Really, really bad. Really bad. But they give us money for it. So that was the point. We had to eat the, the <laughs> egg. It's disgusting. 1,000 years old. Yeah. An egg. It's not actually 1,000. Yeah, thousand. sure. But a, a disgusting egg. Yeah. That's how they call it. But it's, I think they, they dropped it in soya. That's why you make the, the, the eggs all black. I don't know how long they left it inside. Mm -hmm. It's really, really bad. So, and uh, the second day that we had, we, uh, we were in Tajikistan and we had to swim in this lake. So it was at 4,000 meters in altitude. The water was maybe three degrees, you know, like it was extremely cold. And we had to swim with a dress. We had a, a school dress and we had to jump in this lake and uh, it was freezing cold. I was, I, <laughs> we did it for charity, so it was fun. Wow, that was Lake, it was at Lake Karakol in Tajikistan. Yeah, Lake Karakul in yeah. Tajikistan. That's the yeah. highest elevated lake in the world, right? It's a salt lake, yeah. It's yeah. a salt lake. Yeah. It's crazy that you know that at 4,000, that means that the, the ocean was actually here, I don't know how many million years ago, because to, to have a salt water there, that's, that's weird, at 4,000 meters in altitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember being at that lake in the in the summertime, and I was I was absolutely freezing just from riding my bike in the summer in Tajikistan. <laughs> so I can't. Uh, when I arrived at Karakol Lake at, at the homestay, I had to wrap myself in blankets for an hour and like shivering like this just to warm up. So I can't even imagine what it would be like getting into the lake after that. So, uh, that was fun. Well, Wow. But the problem that we had to raise money at that time was internet connection because we started in, in Mongolia. We are most of the time in the middle of the desert, no connection. So it was really hard for us to keep up with raising money. Then we arrived to China and we forgot about uh, that China don't have access to Facebook, no Google, and no YouTube. So we couldn't raise money either. And I forgot about the VPN. Then after we went to, uh, to uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and the internet connection was always a problem. So um, it was really, really hard to, to raise money. We did our best, but it was hard. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea to have people send you dares. And then uh, yeah. and if you do it, they send, send money, right? And it sounds yeah, like yeah. they weren't easy at all. No. <laughs> not, not easy at all. But fun, yeah. right? You get a good story out of it now. That's part, yeah. that's part of the story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a great idea. Yeah. And um, yeah, in one of your other videos, I noticed you cycle when you cycled from France to Turkey. I like your the the things you packed, I found really interesting. You oh, okay. packed two pairs of shorts, two pairs of socks, and two shirts, and then diving fins. So I like how you're minimalist with the clothes, but you you had the diving fins for for free diving. So can you yeah, tell us about not free diving it. on that trip? I actually ended up not bringing it. I didn't bring the the fins at the at the end because I was like, am I really gonna be able to have time to to do this? So actually, I didn't bring the fin at the end, <laughs> and I didn't have that much time to go to go swimming either. I swam. A few times in, uh, in Croatia, in Montenegro, but I, I didn't have the time. And I was when, when you're on the bicycle and riding 100 plus kilometers every day, you're quite tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you you do free diving then as well. Is that one of the um, things you do? I did it a few times before COVID. Okay. And I, I, I didn't have time at all to, to do it since since COVID started. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I hope maybe I have more time now that the border is going to reopen that 
the tourism is opening now in, in Malaysia since the 1st of April. So hopefully now I'm going to have time to, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Free diving. That's, that's an intense sport too. I can't imagine yeah. you, you hold, have to hold your breath, right? The yeah, whole time. Yeah. That's the idea. And but uh, I did just a uh, training in the pool. You know, I haven't done free diving in the ocean yet. Okay. So I had a, just a training in the pool with an instructor to teach us how to, to hold your breath longer. And I actually hold my breath for two minutes, 34. Wow. So without, without any, any experience. That was the first time I was trying to hold my breath. And with a few training like this, I was about to hold my breath for, for two minutes, 34, and to, uh, to swim 50 meters, like a Olympic pools. So to, to be able to swim the, the length of the Olympic pools. Wow. Wow. So I was happy about it. But. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, that sounds like uh, once Malaysia opens up, you'll have have uh, plenty of, of islands to explore and, yeah. and oceans to dive in. Yeah, so I'm yeah. sure you're looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> so after all of this uh, travel that you've done, when you go home to France, how do you look at France? I mean, one thing that they say is travel eyes changes your eyes for your own hometown or your home country. What have you noticed about France? The thing is that uh, I never really liked living in France. You know, that's why I left when I was 21 and never really went back. So I always was going back to France to visit my, my family. But I never wanted to stay there. I don't know. There is something about France that is not me. You know, like I don't maybe like the, it's a lot of taxes. You know, every, every, everything is expensive. And... I don't know. It's my, my heart is not, is not in France. My heart is not in France. So I love my parents. I love my friends. Uh, I don't know. I don't have feeling for friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, expats can relate to that feeling. It's a lot of yeah. people ask me the same question. Do you miss the United States? And I always answer the same way that I miss my family. I miss my friends, but you know, home can be anywhere, right? Home can be, in your tent in the middle of Mongolia, right? Or in a yeah, yurt, so exactly. some, some guy that you're drinking tea with, right? On a yeah. cold night, so. But I, lo I, love, I love going back there to see my city again and everything. I love spending two weeks there, but it's to, to live. It's, no, I, I, I can't, it's too expensive, it's too expensive. And now that I'm married to, to Malaysian, if I wanted to, to live in France, my wife don't speak French, and it would not be possible to live there with only one person working. It would not be possible. Sure, sure. Even with the inflation, you know, the, the gas, mm -hmm. the, the, the gas is like two euro 20 a liter now. Wow. What the hell, you know, two euro 20 a liter. How people do to survive? It's not possible. Yeah. You have sure. a, a small apartment, it costs you five or 600 euro a month for to, to, to rent an apartment. Just with one room, I think one room is six hundred euro a month. Then people earn thousand euro. How the hell do you survive? Yeah, yeah. Even though I don't earn much money here in, in Malaysia as a photographer, but you can still go eating for two dollars. So even though you, you you don't earn much money, you can still eat for two dollars at the restaurant in Malaysia. So you can yeah. still manage it. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that's tough, man. But uh, yeah, and your wife, she 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 goes to France with you sometimes when you go back. Yeah, she, she went uh, twice to France with me. Once okay. to to uh, introduce her to to my parents, and the second time when we uh, got married. So yeah. Okay. Okay. And what was her impression of France? Uh, you would need to ask her, but I think she likes it, but okay. it's the same, it's, a, the, 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 it's the same, you know, you, you can't go to, uh, to the restaurant every time you want in France, because it's two people is, is 40, 40 euro, <laughs> you spend 40 euro at the restaurant if you want to eat, so it was really hard for her, you know, every time we're traveling around KL, you, you stop somewhere to eat and it's no problem, you can't do this in France, you cannot go every day to the restaurant, sure. it's possible. Sure. But if sure. you want to have a snack or if you want to have a coffee, a coffee is two euro fifty where I live. You know, you're nearby the you have the, the sea view at the restaurant, you pay two euro fifty for your for your cappuccino is 
as expensive, you know, as yeah, expensive. yeah. You want a beer, you want a beer, a beer is, is nine euro, I think, at the, wow. at the bar. So <laughs> nine euro for a beer, damn. Hard to get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get drunk off of the fresh air and the, and the water. Yeah. It's hopefully yeah. free, right? Coming out of the faucets. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So so let's what do you think? You've traveled so much around the world. What do you think? Um, what's the most important thing that you've learned about yourself as a result of your traveling experiences? What I've learned about myself. I don't know. What can I say? Sorry, it's a tough question. <laughs> To maybe open more to, to to people, you know, to that we are able to to make friends everywhere, and uh, that in general humans are good. <laughs> in general, you know, I don't know if people know about it, Jurobinsky, but he said like ninety nine percent of people are actually good. There's only one percent of people that they are bad. And sorry, I don't, I don't really know. How do you explain yeah. it? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I I have similar experience. I mean, I don't think I've met anybody that's given me a big problem. Um yeah. traveling, you know, just some children in Ethiopia throwing stones, but they're children, right? So you can't really say that they're bad, you know. But, oh, they're uh, not bad. Yeah, uh, yeah. What I say, uh, you learn. You learn that people are good. You learn that, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so tell us about your upcoming walking trip. Tell us about your plans for that. So, like I said, because it's been three years, I didn't go anywhere, and it's it's quite hard for me to spend three years without traveling, without taking the flight, without cycling. And my wife do not cycle, so I said to her, "Why do we don't try to to walk?" You know. And she said, oh, I don't know if I can walk either that, that long, you know? And so let's try to do a small walk first. So we walked from our house to, um, to another place. We did 13 kilometers walking and she was about to do it. And I said, now we can try maybe to walk next to Thailand. You know, it's only 500 kilometers from here. And we can maybe try to raise awareness on the environment at the same time, because people in Malaysia, uh, throw a lot of rubbish you know by the window they throw everything on the ground and everything and it's hard to blame them because there is no education about it so, so maybe we can walk and raise awareness on the environment in malaysia and that's what our plan now is to do about 27 kilometers every day in 20 days and yeah <laughs> wow wow 27 kilometers per day and in june you're leaving too right yeah, so it's going to be extremely hot. It's going to be <laughs> extremely hot. It's going to, because it's the, it's the summer, even though they don't have winter in Malaysia, they, they call it still the summer. That is the moose and season and the summer. So this is the, the summer. So it's going to be, it's going to be really, really, really hot. And you're going to get some rain too, right? Like, uh, yeah, like it's every it's day rain. it'll rain, right? Pretty much. And Most months. of the time in the, in the afternoon, it rains for one hour. So, we need to try to stop by four o'clock because most of the time you rain around four or five o'clock in Malaysia at night. Okay. So if we start early in the morning until four o'clock, we should be able to, to do it. Okay. Okay. I think the normal human work about five kilometers an hour. So five kilometers an hour in six hours, we should be able to, to complete it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And uh, what kind of, are you doing some physical training? to get ready for this trip or? Uh, at the moment, my wife can't because she's, she's fasting. Oh, so okay. she, can't, she can't do uh, training at the moment. So she just paused uh, the gym for, for her for this month. But in May, I told her that we're gonna need to, to train, you know, like to train on our legs and to walk at least 20 kilometers a week. So twice 10 kilometers uh, a week to to get used to it you know even even for me it's been a very very long time i didn't work on my legs so uh, need to train our legs i think okay and how and will you 
How, will you be carrying backpacks? I remember you looking for some sort of wagon, right, to, to push yeah. along. Are you, yeah. did, did you decide to get that or will you take a backpack? Or? Uh, I was trying to find the, the one that you pull, you know, that's a, a kind of a small trailer, like a trailer mm-hmm. for the bicycle that you tie it up on, on, your, on your waist and you can just pull it. But uh, I only seen it in the um, U.S., and uh, to, to send it over Malaysia is too expensive. They charge like a hundred plus dollars to, to ship it, and the, the, the thing costs around three or four hundred dollars as well. The trader, so five hundred dollars investment on this is, is too expensive. It's too expensive. So we're gonna carry backpack idea. Okay. Okay. I'm probably gonna carry the backpack, and she's probably gonna carry a small backpack because <laughs> my wife, my wife is quite small. You know she. She's only 48 kilos. Uh, if I give her a backpack with 10 kilos, it's going to be really tough for her to, to walk. So I'm probably going to carry all the weight. <laughs> yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> going uh, in, uh, uh, going hiking with, with Korean women, are, it's very similar. I always end up <laughs> carrying everything. <laughs> and they're not more than 50, 50 kilograms either. You yeah. know, 50, 50 is heavy in, in Korea yeah. for a woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's, well, it sounds like you have quite an adventure coming up. I mean, that's that's really, really exciting. Um, so for somebody just starting out with adventure travel or just listening to this and thinking, wow, I really want to hit the road or I really want to do something and leave home, what advice would you give somebody just starting out with adventure travel i just said to them to go for it you know like don't wait why would you like why would you wait just go for it because most of people will say oh okay we maybe do this you know i want to do this but they actually never done it so just just do it you know like don't wait don't waste your time don't waste your time you know like i re- for example i regret not starting my youtube channel when i was actually backpacking in in 2008, you know, I should have started YouTube and uh, blogging and everything at that time, but because it was not something that people used to do at that time, I should have started like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It would have been, it would have been great. Because <laughs> yeah. I always say, oh, I will do this later. You know, I will do this on the next trip. I will do this on the next trip. And at the end, I wait 2018 to 2020 to start it. Too late. Not too late, not too late. It's never too late, but now it's a lot of competition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of YouTubers out there, a lot of yeah. a lot of blogs, right? Um, yeah, but uh, but it's it's I hope you're having fun. It sounds like you're having a lot of fun doing the things yeah. you do though. So yeah. so tell us about your your you your future plans. So you're going on this walking trip, and then I heard about a potential cycling trip from France to Senegal. Can you tell us a little bit about that too? Yeah, I really, really want. It's been such a long time I want to go to Africa. Since since I was 16 years old, I always wanted to travel to Africa. But uh, now I'm doing more uh, re- uh, research about this trip. And apparently uh, Mauritania, Senegal is not, it's not really, really good at the moment. And people told me that the border were actually closed, that you can't go through Mauritania and Senegal. So if I cannot go there, I'm going to have to find something else to do because I really, really want to go cycling this year. And um, I really, my, my first thought was to go into, uh, to cycle to Finland. And then there is the war in Ukraine. <laughs> so, you know, like, it's really, really annoying. But I'm, I'm hoping that in, in October, everything will be better with, with Ukraine and that... Uh, the Russian president is not going to attack Finland or other countries in Europe. And if he doesn't, I may go cycling in Europe. I don't know. If it's not possible for me to go to Africa, then we, we, we try to go to Europe again. Yeah, yeah. During winter. <laughs> I will cycle in winter in Europe. It's going to be cold, but I don't care. I need, I need to go back on my bike. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I've, I've been getting the itch myself. It's been tough just... Uh, staying inside and i'm sure it sounds like you feel the same way um, i can't stand it anymore i really can't stand it anymore i really really need to get back on my, on my bicycle yeah 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 great 
All right. Well, we've been going for over an hour now. So can you tell us how we can get in touch with you or follow you? So if you want to follow me on the YouTube, it's called Discover Evolution, Roman and Fisa. So you can join me and subscribe to our channel. That would be awesome. And we also on Instagram. So same Discover Evolution on Instagram. And we also on Facebook, Discover Evolution. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening today. And be sure to follow Roman and his wife, Fiza. And we wish him the best of luck. It sounds like he has a lot of wisdom. He's doing a lot of great things for the world. And he already has done a lot of great things for the world, you know, fighting for women in Africa and environmental uh, environmental awareness. And so this is what global citizenship is all about, exploring the world finding yourself and doing something to make the world a better place. So exactly. thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. And we'd love to have you back anytime to hear about the results of your, of your walking trip. So good that luck. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Josh. All right. <laughs>